on this, the day of resurrection three, we turn our attention to the word of our God. Our first lesson is found recorded for us in the historical book of Acts, Acts chapter two, verse 14a, and then 36 through 47. In these particular words, we're going to hear the end of the day of Pentecost and the wonder and marvel that God works on that day. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and spoke loudly and clearly to them. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Gentlemen, brothers, what should we do? Peter answered them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call. He testified solemnly with many other words and was appealing to them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added. They continued to hold firmly to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and to the prayers. Awe came over every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They were selling their possessions and property and were distributing the proceeds according to what everyone needed or anyone needed. Day after day, with one mind, They were devoted to meeting in the temple area as they continued to break bread in their homes. They shared their food with glad and sincere hearts as they continued praising God and being viewed favorably by all the people. Day after day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Here ends our first lesson. Our next lesson is our epistle lesson. That epistle lesson is found for us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 21. Do note, this text will serve as the basis for our sermon. If you call on the Father who judges impartially according to the work of each person, conduct yourselves during the time of your pilgrimage in reverence, because you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, not with things that pass away, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or spot. He was chosen before the foundation of the world, but revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Here ends our lesson. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Our hearts were burning within us while he was speaking to us along the road and while he was explaining the scriptures to us. Alleluia. Please rise for the gospel. The Holy Gospel for this evening is found recorded for us in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Please note in this particular section, we hear of Jesus meeting the two disciples going on their way to Emmaus. This is, of course, uh, on Easter morning or Easter afternoon that this takes place into Easter evening. And What a marvel it is that Jesus is going to explain to them he is the very fulfillment of Scripture. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing this, Jesus himself approached and began to walk along with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. He said to them, What are you talking about as you walk along? Saddened, they stopped. One of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked them. They replied, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God, and all the people 
uh, and all the people, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. Not only that, but besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Also, some women of our group amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. When they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb. They found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. He said to them, how foolish you are and slow of heart to believe that all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and to enter his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village where they were going, he acted as if he were going to travel further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, since it's almost evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he reclined at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and began give it to the, giving it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Then he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us along the road, and while he was explaining the scriptures to us? They got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those who were with them assembled together. They were saying, The Lord really has been raised. He has appeared to Simon. They themselves described what had happened along the road and how they recognized him when he broke the bread. Here ends our gospel lesson. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of our God to which we turn our attention this evening is our epistle lesson. Please allow me to read it again. If you call on the Father who judges impartially, according to the work of each person, conduct yourselves during the time of your pilgrimage in reverence, because you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, not with things that pass away, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without blemish or spot. He was chosen before the foundation of the world, but revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are in God. This is God's word. let you and I continue with prayer. Wonderful and merciful Father, again we thank you for the opportunity to gather together to give you worship and praise and glory and honor. And this worship and praise is due to you simply because of your Son, Jesus Christ, and what he has done and accomplished for us. Help us, dear Lord, to hear and to simply believe. And where we falter, dear Lord, give us strength and wisdom. In Jesus we pray. Amen. I think in our world... And I think especially in our good old USA, there are two things that we highly treasure. The first is the idea of freedom. We want to be free to live our lives in the way we want and how we want with as little interference as possible. And I'll tell you, I think that's a noble thing. But I'm not sure it's a real thing. And here is what I mean. In a society, we need to recognize that freedom always has its limits. So I'm free to do something, that is, I'm free to do something as long as my freedom doesn't interfere with your freedom. So for instance, I am free to swing my arms, to flail them around like a wild man, but I am not free to do that when I am around others. I cannot swing my arms in a crowd, for that would hit and hurt others. For that matter, I cannot swing my arms if the process, in the process of swinging, I interfere with anyone else. Such is the limitation of freedom. So, for instance, on that limitation, we recognize we can't go on the highway and drive 100 miles an hour. It's against the law. Why? Why? To, or drive recklessly, because in truth, that endangers others and their well-being. 
Now, I really want you to think about, about, about what I just said. And then I'm going to tell you that in my lifetime, to my recollection, I can at least think of two times where laws were enacted because of the principle I just mentioned, and initially, we didn't like it. To begin, there was that seatbelt law passed in the 1960s. Enacted because it does and it has saved lives. Enacted because it helped to prevent injuries. And behind the idea of preventing injuries or death was also the fact that someone had to cover the cost of those injuries and so to save money for all, the seatbelt laws were passed. And I remember so many people, perhaps you, railing and ranting about how our freedoms were being taken away from us. And isn't it an interesting thing that today we really give no thought to the issue. We just get in our cars and we put on our seatbelts because we know that's what's best. Or think about how in our lifetimes we have made a complete attitude change when it comes down to the issue of smoking. We ban cigarette commercials and put warning labels on the products of tobacco all because it was found that cigarette smoking tobacco products was a leading cause of cancer. It was killing people. And so for the protection of the people and for economic impact, because when people got cancer, medical bills soared, we attacked smoking. But here's what I find interesting. I've always found it fascinating that we couldn't just outright ban cigarettes and tobacco because people raised such a fuss and people screamed that our freedoms were being taken away. And so the, for the most part, the way tobacco and that issue was handled is that we have let the higher cost people endure to be the regulator of smoking. You will pay higher premiums for health insurance, for instance, if you're a smoker. And without doubt, you, will, you pay higher costs for tobacco today. We know it's deadly, but we just didn't turn around and stop it. And often we didn't stop it because of the name and the, uh, the, you know, the cry of freedom. But I like to simply sit down and, and remind somebody who is a smoker, don't complain when you can't afford your cancer treatments. Now, the, the other issue that's so important for ourselves is that idea of justice. We want a justice system that is absolutely fair and impartial. And I absolutely think that such justice is the ideal and is very much desired for our lives. But again, in a sinful world, I'm not sure that such justice is, is, you know, is real. I say that because we live in a world where everyone wants to be the exception to the rule. So for instance, in a nutshell, I could say everybody wants what? They want... They don't want you to steal their stuff, but they want the right to steal your stuff. That seems to be pretty well the normal attitude in our world. Now, that's really the simplest way of putting the issue. You see, we want our social status, or we want our economic status, or our education status, or our emotional status, or our, but that's what I want status, to regulate the application of the law to our lives. And we actually teach this idea, and you've probably heard it. We say, well, that's your truth, but my truth is different. Well, dear people, that's our way of saying, I want to be the exception to the rules. It's just the reality of our world. Please note that our text actually addresses the issue of justice. It reminds us that ultimately and absolutely there is a judgment coming, but it reminds us that a wonderful and, and awesome exception to the law has been provided. Let's consider our text under this theme. You were redeemed. I know the world will disagree, but here is what God's word says. There is a judgment day coming. Please note when we speak about the judgment day, we speak of this in two separate ways. Each of us, if we are here before Jesus comes again, each of us will experience a personal judgment day at the very moment of our death. In other words, we are going to find ourselves standing before the throne of God. The other way that we speak of, the actual, uh, speak of this judgment day is the actual judgment day when it's clear that Jesus is returning and that all God says about the end of this world and the beginning of his eternal perfect world will begin. 
Either way, what you need to grasp is that in the blink of an eye, you will find yourself before the judgment throne of God to be judged according to the standards of the laws of God. Note what our text says of God. The Father judges impartially according to the work of each person. Well, there it is. There will be the perfect, holy, and absolute, impartial judgment of God. He will judge everyone by His standard. God has given us His law, and that law will stand as our judge, absolutely impartial in every way. In regards to our judgment, I always like to point to a couple of different passages because I think that they, those passages pretty well lay it out. But let me just share for you my favorite one of those two passages, and that's John chapter 12, verses 46 through 48. And those words say this, I've come into this world as a light so that everyone who believes in me would not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words but does not hold on to them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my word does have a judge. The word which I spoke will judge him on the last day. So I simply encourage you, pay attention to what Jesus says here. He did indeed come to save the world, but he left his word as the very standard of what will be. And when we reject the word, especially when we reject its core truths, then I'm going to tell you, you and I are going to have a problem. And I hope to help you grasp this evening how it works, this, how it works, this faith thing works for us. So make no mistake, God, in an absolutely impartial way, is going to judge each person according to the works of their lives. Remember, God only accepts holy and perfect works. He doesn't take almost, and he doesn't take, but I tried. Either you are holy and perfect, or you will have a problem before God. And I want to tell you now at this point that the next line of our section is so important. It's important because already each of us here has been terribly frightened, terribly frightened by the fact that you are going to be judged on whether or not you are pure and holy. And I say terribly frightened because each of us knows absolutely and without a doubt that we have sin and problems and uglinesses. And in fact, each and every one of us grasp that there is nothing Nothing holy and pure about any of us. So the next lines are utterly important. The next lines say this. Conduct yourselves during the time of your pilgrimage in reverence, because you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. Let's just stop here for a moment. <clears throat> in a nutshell, here is what this says. You have been given... Your life, right now, what you are, you've been given this life before the Lord. And as you go through this journey of life, God's Word says you should do so with reverence. That is, you should do so with both a fear and an awe. Fear that you don't dishonor the Lord, and awe that you have a care and concern to hear and follow the Lord. Now, I want to emphasize, did you get that? A care and concern to follow the Lord. This is not about work righteousness. Because that is the reference found here that speaks about the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. That line tells you what the issue of work righteousness is. Work righteousness is empty. Work righteousness is really rather useless. And by the way, if you're going to save yourself by your own works and goodness, exactly when will you know that you have been good enough or that you have enough works to your credit to get into heaven? And how do you know how many credits you have? And just who is it that sets and determines 
just what works are holy and pure. What are you going to tell me? Oh, I burned incense today for a whole hour and sat sitting and thinking. I mean, seriously, people, what does that count for your salvation? Or maybe you're going to tell me, well, I didn't stare very long at the picture of that girl in the hot pink bikini. Or maybe you're going to say, well, I worshiped today and I sang extra loud. Or how about this one? Well, I said prayers today and I only got distracted four times. Dear people, I could go on and on with such examples. Can any of you tell me the worth of any of this to your eternal life and salvation? To paying the cost, the redemption price needed to make up for your sins? The fact is, you can't do that. And if you try, I will absolutely, in a heartbeat, be able to tell you why you are wrong. Trust me, you don't want to try and get saved by works. And yet, we are told to live with reverence, to work at what is right and good according to the Lord our God. And now I want to say, well, why? Well, did you miss that line in this section? The line that said to us, because you know that you were redeemed. You were redeemed. Someone somehow has bought you back, has made you a child of God and an heir of eternal life. Someone has paid the price for you. Dear people, that someone is Jesus. And our verse continues. You were redeemed. Not with things that pass away, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without blemish or spot. There it is. There's the only hope we have. We have been redeemed. We have been bought back. It was done by Jesus who went to the cross to pay, totally pay for our sins. He paid the price with his perfect life, with his suffering and death for us, with his paying the debt of sin that stood against us and that damned us. In other words, he was damned for us. He is the one and only solution. Bluntly put, Jesus is the only exception to the demands of the law. Either you put yourselves into the hands and justice of Jesus or you will stand and face the demanding and damning force of the law of God that says you must be holy in thought, word, and deed. And look further. He was chosen before the foundation of the world, but revealed in these last times for your sake, through him, uh, through him you are believers in God who raised him from the dead. Clearly, the issue of faith is before us. We are simply told that even before the foundation of the world were, were laid, Jesus was already chosen to be our Savior. No, I can't fully explain that. Other than to say that it deals with the eternal nature and complete knowledge and wisdom of our God. So here's the fact. Even while God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was planning this creation, this very creation of ours, planning for our holiness and perfection as those created in the image of God, God already knew that we would need a Savior. And God knew that it would be Jesus, His Son, that would be that Savior. Jesus came for our sake. That's the issue of faith. Either you believe Jesus came to redeem you, or you do not. Either you believe Jesus is the Son of God and our Savior, or you do not. Because through Jesus you were believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. Now, dear people, that sentence sums up the total work of redemption that Jesus did. God sent Jesus to die for our sins, to pay the atonement price, the redemption cost for all the sins of all the world for all of time. God told us we would know who the Savior was because he would rise from the dead and he would be given glory and honor forever. Is there anyone here who does not grasp that this is the wonder of Jesus? 
it is being made clear that Jesus and what he is is the whole key to this. Jesus came to save us. Jesus came to redeem us. In Jesus, the very thing we need for eternal life and salvation is provided. That's holiness and perfection. We are clothed with the robe of his righteousness. But please don't forget to go back and grasp that faith, faith is clearly a proponent of this gift of Jesus. Because by faith, a believer lives in reverence to God. A believer hears and follows God's word, not to save themselves, but rather because they realize that in Jesus they are saved. And that's always the key. In Jesus, you and all of us are saved. And then that last encouragement, so that your faith and hope are in God. I don't know, that's just so simple, isn't it? It's all about Jesus. But again, let me help you get this. I'm going to simply talk about my faith. I have total faith in the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and salvation. I have total faith in what Jesus has won for me. And because of that faith, I strive to live in reverence to Jesus. I work to glorify his name. I work to speak his truth. I work to conduct my life in accord with his word. He has called me to his light, and I don't like and chase after darkness. And where I, because of fleshly weakness and sickly faith, disobey and dishonor God, in other words, where I sin, I am led to repent, and in that repentance know that in Jesus I am forgiven. Dear people, here is what faith does in all of our lives. See, I don't claim to be holy and perfect. I claim that Jesus was holy and perfect for me, and all you need to do is grasp that in my life, and with reverence, I follow and believe in Jesus. Sometimes pretty badly, but I follow and believe in Jesus. And I can tell you, that my attitude is not, Jesus, I'm going to do this sin and you are going to have to suffer all the more for me and like it and I don't want to hear any complaints and demands from you. I will do what I want to, Jesus, and you will just have to suffer for it and I demand it. If that's your attitude, as you live blindly in the darkness of your sin, tell me. How is that reverence to God? Tell me how that fits the issue of faith in Jesus. Dear people, I'm trying so hard to help you see the wonder of Jesus. He has died for you. He has risen from the dead that you might have eternal life and salvation. And I say, please believe in him. Please note that your salvation is about him. And please put your faith and your hope in God, not in you, in any way. And just join me in humbly saying, Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Amen. Rise for prayer. Dear Jesus, our risen Savior, Truly you are our good shepherd, for you gave your life for us, your sheep. Surely it was your great love for us sinners who were lost and straying that moved you to come into this world to live, to die, and to rise again, that we might have the life that does not end. Good shepherd, we owe you our heartfelt thanks and praise and our continual love and devotion for all that you have done and still do to ensure our earthly and eternal welfare. It is true we have become your sheep by trusting that you are our Savior and God, Nevertheless, we must confess that we still have a rebellious old Adam that is stubborn and sinful and continually leads us astray. Therefore, you need, you need your loving patience as our good shepherd to deliver us from our sinful ways, to protect us from our own foolishnesses, and to forgive our many sins. We need you to take the evils and dangers that beset us and turn them to our good. We need you to hear and answer our prayers. And we need to hear and heed the sound of your voice as you speak to us in Holy Scripture. Do not, on account of our sins and stubbornness, turn away from us. 
Our shepherd, by your continual presence, comfort and cheer us in every journey that we must make through the dark, shadowy valleys of this life. Satisfy us with the green pastures of your word and there nourish our faith. Quench our thirst for righteousness with the refreshing streams of salvation. When we are oppressed on every hand by troubles and distress, temptation, sickness, sin, and heartache. Yes, when life seems too difficult to endure, teach us to turn our eyes of faith to you, the good shepherd, and to cast all our cares upon you. Answer our anxious cries, for only you know what is best for us. Refresh us with your help and guidance, your protection and healing. Especially when we walk through the valley of death itself, be with us. Shepherd and oversee our souls. Dispel the gloom that surrounds us with the bright promise of salvation, filling us with joy and confidence as one by one we journey from this life to heaven. Cause goodness and mercy to follow us the rest of our days. Hear us, merciful Savior and Shepherd, in the name of Jesus, he who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.